good morning or good evening or whatever i'm gonna be recording a star wars unlimited video today about the deck that i played in planetary qualifier berlin where i did very well with six wins and only one double loss and nothing else and uh, i definitely played in the top eight anyway so let's talk about the deck i'm gonna be for the first time ever using my uh my phone as a camera so we see how that works um, here I have my hat, uh, my, my deck. I'm going to talk a little bit about the matchups and about the cards itself. We're going to start with the cards itself. So we're going to go first. I played, of course, Boba Fett. Um, I think currently my favorite character in, in Star Wars Unlimited. I think it's just so cool to play. I know it's a little bit considered overpowered, uh, but I just enjoy playing the deck because it gives you so many avenues. Uh, and it plays, sp plays powerful cards. You can play Maul and Vader in one deck, which is fantastic. The showcase looks absolutely beautiful. And then I start talking about the base because it's one of the bigger topics uh, when it comes to what do you play actually in Boba Fett. So first, I prefer Energy Conversion Lab over the 30 HP base because the 30 HP base has almost no utility and it only gives you better better sur survivability right like that's a 30 hp base has 30 hp that's it yeah i don't like that i like the 25 hp because of the epic action that gives you an ambush it gives me more out um, possible outplays against different opponents in in current metagame um i played boba with ecl for over a month preparing for the planetary qualifier and i think ecl is crucial in matchups like against other Boba Fets, which is a very popular deck, it doesn't matter which color the Boba plays, it doesn't matter if it's green, red, or yellow, you having an ECL gives you an possible out um, and, and, and possible snowball effect against other Bobas, which the other Bobas who don't play ECL don't have. Against the Sabine, it also gives you possible outplays and essentially buys you virtual HP. One of the biggest um, biggest arguments that people always do when they discuss ECL and 30 HP base is like, oh, with 30 HP base, you're so much better into aggro. And I do understand the sentiment, but I do disagree with the sentiment that it's always better because what Energy Conversion Lab does... Um, is it, it it literally buys you i mean figuratively sorry um buys you additional hp think about it this way if i for example will kill a unit with seventh fleet defender that i ecl'd let's say it's an a-wing or a red free and i kill that unit that unit doesn't attack me probably doesn't attack me even twice which means that this 25 HP becomes effectively 28 or 31. So sometimes it's even better than 30 base, just because you are able to ECL a unit into another unit, your unit stays and also buys pressure, which also creates a disproportionate HP, which is an asymmetrical effect for both players. So it's very hard to like essentially say how much exactly HP you have in every single game because it depends on the context but i do i think that energy conversion lab is typically between 28 to 33 hp on average on every game of course there will be some games when you will be at 25 because you just didn't have an opportunity to use ecl well but it's a huge huge um reason why i was able to perform well with this deck just because i play ecl now Let's start talking about the cards that I have in my deck. Oh my god, oh my god. yeah, it was, that, those are my subs. One second. Uh, anyway, uh, let's talk about the cards that are always in the deck, which is three super laser technicians and three resupplies. Like, this deck doesn't work without ramp. Uh, I mean, sorry, it does work, but it works way worse. So those cards are essentially always in your deck. But I do think that sometimes, depending on the um, on the context and on what you have in the sideboard, you can actually uh, side out super laser technicians against other aggro decks. Like some fast aggro decks, you might not like to play super laser technician, uh, but resupply because of its effect uh, being instant, you will keep that. Because sometimes you just go, like when it comes to action economy, you will prefer to go resupply, go to five 
um five mana five resources and instantly flip which you can't really do with the super laser technician unless you ecl but i don't prefer doing that so that's one thing now with uh, those six cards already discussed this is 44 that uh, 44 slots that are left so ramp stays almost always in every single matchup right and now we talk about the early drops i play three greedos because i think greedos are just important in most of the matchups uh and they stay in the deck in most of the matchups apart you play against a bosk uh against a bosk you want to make sure that those creatures cannot be killed with uh you know like they have one hp you don't want to play one hp against the bosk but against other um matchups you probably always want to have a greedo uh especially now it's better against sabine because of McClunkies. um in the past sometimes when you were going second and sabine played a sabine unit you were like well okay i guess i don't play my greedo or i have to ecl into it and that's not a good idea so um now greedos be became much better i play three because i think it's important to have that early pressure you Cannot forget about the fact that this is a three attack unit as well. So when your opponent plays a 25 base, this is actually very potent when it comes to dealing damage to your opponents. So yeah, very standard stuff. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a controversial thing because I love personally Celestius Crumb. I think it's a great, uh, great unit um, because it's, it gives you let's say few possibilities of of not playing in your typical fashion the fact that you can like use your own crump to destroy your own uh, super lazy technician allows you to um essentially play around the fact that someone cannot play it look is not playing grand units and that happens like that happens um a lot actually against control decks when they try to avoid giving you a possibility of destroying an slt and crump prevents that from happening when you play a 25 hp base like i do with the ecl also that one hp heal uh will matter in a lot of situations but i do think that as that there's a possibility of playing ecl without crump and being a little bit more aggressive than my deck is, which is something that I would probably do um, now if I would have to play with an ECL deck. But I love Crumbs, and I didn't regret playing them uh, in the tournament. Now, Mercenary Gunship, I have two of them in main, uh, and they could be, and this is a... I'm still not certain if I was correct with playing Mercenary Gunships over Cartel Spaces. Cartel Spaces are two mana, two, three, and the effect is not that important, but it sometimes, you know, makes a difference. But it was more important that you can pull the Carter spaces out of Vader. You cannot do that with the mercenary gunships. But I was predicting that there's going to be a lot of Sabines in the tournament. And having a 2-mana 3-2, that, that you can ECL on turn 1 and kill an A-Wing and still have a mercenary gunship on the board is actually huge for winning the race. Now... I actually didn't get to play a single Sabine, but I still think it was a probably a correct choice to play gunships over uh, Carter spaces. And to remember, one of the biggest problems in green decks is that if you don't have a unit to play um, overwhelming barrage on, then you probably gonna lose the game in like uh, board control tempo oriented matchups. So having a mercenary gunship when people think that you don't play units in space and they control your your ground is important because many times when I played in different tournaments, a mercenary gunship that got played with, with an um, overwhelming barrage was game winning because suddenly you deal five damage to units on the ground and you're able to raise for five damage to the face. So yeah, but this, uh, I always play with two, three, um, two or three pieces of um, ships for round one, essentially. Uh, and now, most important card in the deck, I think. Bazin Natal. Um, never come... Like, I never play with less than three. That's it. Like, this unit is insane. Um, absolutely bonkers. And it, it's one of those cards that will show if you understand matchups. And will show also if you understand timings. Because um, 
in many it's one of those biggest decisions bigger decisions when you have to ask yourself do i resource this card or do i keep it for two do i have the time to use it for four mana in specific matchups when is the best moment to, to use for 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 that moment as well so for example if you play against a blue slow control deck in most cases it's gonna be important to um resource this card play it from smuggle and use it on 10 uh on seven resources when you can use it before your opponent have the chance to use a super laser blast so you can take that super laser blast out of their hand and you still don't lose a card advantage right but in many cases is you don't have the option to squeeze the card from smuggle because it costs four instead of two and then advance the board at the same time so many times when i was playing against even control decks i was keeping a bazin natal in my hand because i knew that then when i'm going into the later game because of the way my deck is constructed at seven resources i would prefer to play natal for two and a five drop so i i advanced the board and i built pressure instead of just playing natal, natal for four resources and then have only three resources to actually build up my board depends on the context as always that's something that is not just one and zero um choices in star wars unlimited because every game looks different and it all depends how many informations you're getting how many tells you can like get from your opponent specifically important for bazin i think people don't think enough about how to play this card and when to play this card and the information that you get before which i kind of regret that i don't play uh the viper probe droid i think it would be fantastic to play viper probe droid when you have bazin natals to like build up upon that information but there's no way i can fit like maybe instead of salacious crump but no this is an underworld creature if you change salacious crumbs you want to have another underworld creature i think but anyway bazin natal mvp um Maybe I should buy hyperspaces of them. Okay, so those are the early drops, and um, you play three, five, seven, ten of them, and all of them are underworld because of the card called. I'm gonna talk about it right now because it's important for the context. Uh, we have three McClunkies. McClunkies are MVPs of this deck uh, as well. Uh, incredibly important against Sabines, Bobas um and bosks as well and against control decks too oh so a card good against every single matchup yeah seems like a good card to me so why is it good in uh like many people ask me like why why do you say it's good against control decks and in a control deck you uh sorry against a control deck you have to think about it this way this card resets damage damage on a unit that you bounce allows you to go through um some smaller sentinels which is very underrated and also what is even more important it gives you an additional attack with a fire spray my game plan against very slow control decks is to hit them three times with a, with a fire spray essentially so when you're going into a very very long game and you can squeeze a fire spray from hand mcclunky into fire spray from hand you will probably win so uh yeah um mcclunky is a fantastic card bouncing a unit that also had like some upgrades on it like um bounties against the bosk for example is also pretty huge and it bounces units that have entrench on it as well right so this is pretty pretty huge um so we'll keep events over here i was talking about those events because they connect with the underworld here but in general yeah um that's about it now let's talk about the other units that we have in the deck so uh we have three seven fleet defenders the seven fleet defenders i have see people cutting them i don't understand that i think seven fleet defenders are fantastic against sabine are great against or bobas as well and are fantastic against control decks because they're hard to remove so yeah i i don't i don't see how i would cut three seventh fleet defenders or any like any of them especially specifically good against uh, sabine with ecl right so one of the tricks that people uh, i think they should be aware by now that it's a possibility uh but um maybe they don't so i'll speak about it what you can do uh is let's say your opponent plays an a-wing 
which is a very common opener in turn one when play when they play Sabine. You might skip your turn one if you don't have like a one drop into McClunky, and you can take the initiative. When you take the initiative, you start the round by seven fleeting ACL into the A wing. So what you do is you set up the events in a different manner than you would typically do. You play seven fleet defender. His shielded effect goes on the stack, but his ambush effect from ECL also goes on the stack. So you choose to ambush first, so your 3-2 attacks into a 1-3, you get dealt 1 damage, you kill the opposing unit, and after that you shield the unit. So now you have a 3-mana three 3-1 three shielded unit, and you probably won space by doing that. And it counters a possible wing leader play, for Sabines, and they essentially have to sacrifice like the entire space arena just because you did this one play. And this is also where you have to think about how Energy Conversion Lab affected your HP, because now by, by killing the A-Wing, you denied the, its first attack, which means that now your HP effectively is 28. But also, if you had been playing a 30 HP base, if you played the 7 Fleet Defender, that A-Wing would have attacked you twice. Which means that effectively your Energy Conversion Lab is going to be 31 HP. And I feel like many people don't think about Energy Conversion Lab in this way. Uh, but yeah, um, 3 7 Fleet Defenders, lovely. Now, 3 Boba Fetts. I, I was trying out Toro Calicans instead, or making like a combination of one Toro Calican and two Boba Fetts, or one Boba Fett and two Toro Calicans. But I'll tell you this, when you play ECL, Boba Fett is still very good, and it will catch people off guard when you actually ECL Boba Fett into a unit that was tapped um, before it attacked. So, sorry, after it attacked, and suddenly you deal a free damage for free. And you control the board much more easily, but also uh, because obviously in the deck we'll talk about the Boba Fett's armor later on. When I play three units of, of Boba Fett, I increase the possibility of value from Boba Fett's armor. So, and that's something that many people just forget that you can do. Like, you play Boba Fett, you play Boba, uh, Boba armor on the Boba Fett unit instead of your leader... And suddenly Boba Fett is just a monster and you can freely do that against, for example, green-red decks because they have no way of removing that unit. You play against a Palpatine, you play green one, you play armor on Boba Fett. Suddenly it's incredibly hard to remove. Like, you have to think about how much, how many answers your opponents will have to a armored unit of Boba Fett if they if the answer is not many well then you probably will do it sometimes it's better to armor the unit than the leader and that's why I keep three of them and I know that the three mana and four mana units in this deck are not particularly useful if you choose to ramp but sometimes you don't get the, the ramp and you need to have the plan B right I understand when people like don't play like almost any four drops and three drops because they think they will ramp every turn uh, every every game and if they don't ramp they essentially shrug it off as a loss I am not willing to do that so I play three Boba Fitz. and then I play also two Forlums now Forlums I play the package of like this is essentially a one package so we're going to talk about it in in a seven card slot Essentially, uh, I started building this deck with before Boba was popular, right? Or like had a resurgence of popularity. And I was still playing ECL, but I was playing three Forlorns and three Zuckers. And, and, and essentially, this was the slot. But because Boba got popular, I had to find avenues to make the mirror match better. And this is what I came up. So essentially... Um, Zakas is great against everything else that is not a Boba, because a 6-6 six, six Ambusher with ECL kills most of the leaders, kills a Ray. you don't care about Sentinels, you don't care about Shields, kills an Obi-Wan, kills a uh, Han Solo, uh, both of them essentially, right? You, you kill majority of the leaders with Zakas, but Steadfast Battalion kills a Boba Fett. That's why I have three, and that's the only reason why I have three. But because I play also Steadfast Battalion uh, in this deck, it changes the way that you actually play a lot of matchups because of the overwhelm. People are not thinking enough about how much damage a Steadfast Battalion can deal 
while controlling the board. Sometimes, I mean, not sometimes, most of the matches that I won were because of the aggro plan, not because of like controlling boards and stuff. I think I, during the entire seven rounds of Swiss, I think I played a Darth Vader one, but I played more, probably like 12. And if I could play like five moles, I would play five moles. So, Stedfast Battalion falls into that place. He's like a small mole, essentially. And you're, if, if, when you start thinking about it this way, those cards for five mana become just incredibly aggressive cards that you first use to control the board and, and then deal potentially damage to the face. Sometimes you skip playing cards just to take initiative so you can hit the base one time with a Zuckers. Again, context matters. But you have to think about the Overwhelm from Steadfast Battalion and count the damage to set up like potential lethals with a mole because that is doable. Many games were closed out because I played Steadfast Battalion into something, into mole, and then take initiative and just finish the game. You ha I always have to count the damage and you always have to count, can I set up two turns lethal against decks like Sabine, against a uh, deck like Boba is tougher because of the possibilities of like getting bounced and tapped and so on. But against decks that are more easily predictable, like Sabine, counting the damage to set up two turns lethal is incredibly important. So yeah, that's uh, another package of the units. Then we have three fire sprays. I don't think this card needs to be talked about. You just play three and you kill your opponent. Like, it's insane. Like, the card is bonkers, and um, with McClunky, it becomes even better. Uh, like, remember, I had some matches where, where, where Fed's Fire Spray was entrenched, which I'm okay with, because then it becomes a target for overwhelming barrage that deals 10 damage, 10 damage, actually happened in the tournament. And also, it just stays on the board till I have a McClunky to bounce it and just attack again. So, it's like a... It's like a unit that threatens the opponent. And like, it's bonkers. Like, just play free. Uh, then we have the package of the seven drops. If I could play five moles, I would play five moles. But because you can't, I play, I play three moles and two Vaders. Now, I do have one of those. And it's beautiful. I might actually buy a second one to have two of them in the deck. But, um, I digress. So... Three moles, incredibly important in this deck. I think this deck would not have not be winning as much without moles. If I would have to play like three Vaders and something else instead of moles, I would probably not play this deck. The mole is able to put so much pressure on the opponents and you're able to combo with so many of the underworld units that you have in this deck. It's crazy. And also, when you play mole, when you know that you're going to play mole on seven resources, try to squeeze in one of the smaller units from the Underworld package from this before. Try to squeeze it even when you lose like a potentially like an action or initiative. Because keeping your mole healthy because you transfer the damage to one of the small units is essential of building a secondary attack with the mole that you played. So... On the six resources turn, if you can squeeze a Crumb or a Greedo at the end of the turn and your opponent will not clear the small shit that you played, you're in and you essentially get a 7-6 ambush that kills something, deals damage to the base and stays on the ground undamaged. It was essentially uh, very important as well. This kind of play was very important for me when I played against uh, Palpatines and I played twice against them. So it was like one of those very important things to set up. Um, so yeah, so that's the seven drops. Now we'll let's talk about uh, the other non-unit cards. So uh, first and foremost, three of a mowing barrage. You don't play less. That's it. Um, and now three Boba armors. I was playing two and I was like, nope. Go to three Boba units and three Boba armors. We want to play this as much as possible. Uh, and now the slots that people a lot of a lot of people discuss. People, many people play with free blasters. I do think that blasters are worse than surprise attack, but the card advantage actually matters a lot. So having the possibility of smuggling it actually makes a difference. 
but I do think surprise attacks are better in metagame and are more uh, like in, in general are more powerful cards but uh the card advantage does matter a lot so i do play two blasters and sometimes it was like very obvious that i should have been playing surprise strikes and i'm like ah oh my god i should have been playing surprise strikes but again it it's easier to play the blaster and it requires you to make less, less decision making so yeah um blasters are, i have two people play three i would love to squeeze a third in but i don't have a slot to cut um remember though there's a difference between surprise strike and blaster because in one of the instances where it matters for blast for the for, for the blaster is that the blaster builds up attack for the overwhelming barrage synergy so you're able to essentially build a plus four in a unit and that came up uh in the actual tournament when i used a mole i took an initiative it was a seven six because i tanked on the underworld i started the turn i blasted an opponent's face for nine and then i barraged for 11 that was against a ray talk in town and it was a game winning play um but i'll talk about that later so uh, yeah two blasters and then two waylays so two waylays in the main because the sole reason main reason sorry not sole main reason why i choose to play waylays main is because no one else plays them main anymore. Like, you will see that 30 HP Bobas don't play Waylay main, and I think that's a mistake. Um, it makes a lot of Sabines feel incredibly free to play wing leaders on anything and feel like they can be punished, uh, play a Dark Saber on a unit instead of a leader. Yes. And, and, and just, it's a good card. Like, I want it to be played in main. And because of that, I don't play no good to me dead main because this is the same slot in my particular build. Now, I do have it in the sideboard, so let's talk about that. In the sideboard, I have... Give me a second. So, we have in the sideboard two no good to me dead and one more waylay. And that's a package that you essentially... Like, this card comes into the deck against most matchups by the way the third waylay goes into most post uh game one matchups because it, i value it so much no good to me that uh comes into mirror matches comes into sabines and that's essentially it like and against hand yellows i guess um when you want them to not be able to like get like a that, that, that additional one resource right when you don't have a when you don't have an ECL or when you don't have a Zuckers to kill the Han, then you can knock good to me dead. So those are three cards in the sideboard. Then we have um, two true sides, which come in play against control decks. Uh, it's very simple to understand why. You just swap small units for big units. Hey, good deal, right? Very good card. Uh, then we have a package of three units that are, those three slots can be anything. I'll be honest with you. I think you can play whatever three cards that are just big units and you will be fine. I chose to play one Relentless, one Reinforcement Walker, and one Palpatine's Return. I don't like playing like two or three Palpatine Returns because they are major like they are fantastic against blue red decks, but against other type of decks I'd rather have a unit. Um and against super control decks, you could play just a unit instead of Palpatine Return and also be fine. Like, it doesn't really matter that much, like, what kind of unit you play. You just play big, big units. I like Relentless, personally. I, I had time when, it, uh, when I had, like, three of them in the sideboard, but um, what I learned while playing this deck is when I play against control decks, I try to just kill them, you know? Like, that's why Maul is important. That's why playing with the uh with the five drops is important that's why fire spray is important i don't try even like to, like i try i i know that i'm gonna go into late game but i don't try to to win the game by playing like walkers or relentless what i try to do is build constant pressure while being while playing units hard to remove and play around the removal because that wins you the game killing them wins you the game not controlling the board till they say ah oh, fuck me you know so uh, yeah, so that's uh, three, five, seven, and then th three, five. No, sorry, that's eight slots, and then the two cards <laughs> that is giga spicy. Xanadu Bloods. I put them. I didn't want to put them at the, in the beginning. I tested a deck with three Xanadu Bloods and three Fire Sprays at the beginning. 
Uh, and I was like, nah, not a good idea, you know? But in the end, I put two in my sideboard. And uh, I love him. I love him. Why? They're great against almost every single mid-range deck and aggro decks that I played. So the reason why they're good is because I play ECL. The ECL makes actually a difference because this unit in the mirror match kills opposing fire spray. So if you didn't have an ECL used before, that means that Xanadu Blood just goes in, instant kills a ready fire spray before it attacks, and you time walk essentially the game because the opponent didn't do anything for six resources while you did. Not only that, but you're left with a six attack unit in space that your opponent cannot clear in most of the situations. So very important. And I like this when played on attack trigger doesn't happen often, but just the raid two is such a big difference. It also and and people forgot about this being a meta game choice for the black um, sorry black green blue decks. They play the Gar Saxon Gauntlet, which is a five no six mana four five unit Sentinel in space that gets experience token when it gets attacked. So fire spray doesn't kill it. This guy does. So another reason to play it in sideboard. And essentially, this is for me, this is a fire spray number five and six. When I know that fire sprays, are, uh, sorry, fire sprays four and five, because I have three fire sprays and two Zanadu Bloods. So in matchups, when I understand that I want to kill my opponents with space units, they come, they come in. And sometimes you can like bounce a unit to tap a resource, bounce a unit to um, to tap something else. In the mirror match, it can matter because you can bounce like a Boba Fett unit. If you know, it doesn't matter. Like um, it, 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 it just uh, tapping anything would be okay, and it stays on the board. It's on attack trigger as well, and when played, so you have a lot of options. I like the card. Um, that's essentially it. Now. Um, I will talk very briefly, because I know this is a long video already, about the matchups that I had um, during the tournament. Let me just check my notes. So, if you didn't know, I was fucked by the organizers uh, in this tournament, but um, I will still talk about the, the matchups, even though I was paired down every round. Round one was a buy, so I didn't play. Round two, I played against a Boba 30 mirror, and essentially what I explained to you in how I built my deck in the mirror matches happened exactly that way. I was able to uh, carve additional damage with the Steadfast Battalion. I was able to um, stabilize during with, with like consistent pressure. And because of the fact that I have ECL and he doesn't, makes it easy to play for me because I know that that's what how the game was gonna go because I can predict every single play. I knew that his tells are gonna be easy to understand. I knew that he was telegraphing like a boss. He was telegraphing uh, the plays. There was one turn when I essentially knew that he's gonna play a boss at five resources. So I played units that set up his units at one HP so he had like a boss at 1 HP, a leader at 1 HP, and something else at 1 HP or 2 HP. So it was like 1 HP, 1 HP, 2 HP. And I set it up in a way that I knew it's going to happen. So I take the initiative and I just overwhelming barrage all of his units and still have a huge unit on the play. And that essentially solidified the first game. And then in the second game, I think I had some ridiculous draws. Um, and that's essentially it. Now... In the third game, in third round, I played against Pulp Green. When I sat down, I was like, oh, come on, man. Like, there's only one worse matchup, and that's Pulp Blue. I don't like playing against Pulps. They have just too much power. Um, they, they, they threaten of taking your units. It's, it's, it's a problem. Um, and I played against this Pulp Green, but I was able to essentially just kill him before anything happened. I played incredibly aggressive. I tried uh, just make it an impossible to stabilize. ECL came in clutch. Uh, Steadfast Battalion came in clutch. Um, Mole, of course, as well. Like, just dealing constant barrage of damage was important. Every single turn, I was just dealing damage. I was Every single turn, I was just trying to 
put as much tempo as possible. I didn't care about card advantage. I didn't care about my hand size. The only thing that mattered was to clear his unit while dealing damage to the face. I know it sounds simple, but it's like when you don't care about hand advantage, you don't feel like you need to get value and you just like puke your power on, on the board. Sometimes you need to play like a cretin. And that was the game when I had to play like a cretin. I didn't feel, I didn't think about the consequences of my plays during the turn because I knew that if I don't just put constant pressure, I'm going to get punished. So it doesn't, didn't matter that I had a waylay that I played on a small unit because I knew that I had to do it in that moment because of the pressure that I need to have on the board. And it worked out. Then the next round, I played against a Han 1 yellow. And I think the matchup was favoring me. Uh, but in game one, I had abysmal draw. Like, I had nothing. Um, I couldn't play anything on turn one. On turn three, I think I played a defender. Uh, and he played on... No, sorry, I didn't play a defender. I played a Boba Fett on turn three. While he played on his turn one a Falcon. And that one Falcon was not removed essentially for the entirety of the game. It dealt like 15 damage. Game one was very fast and I couldn't do much about it. Uh, in game two, um, I had much better draw. I had a turn one, I had ramp and so on. And I think the matchup went as I think it would have gone. But in game three, I thought I'm going to lose it because there was a... I, I won it in the end, but... There was a turn, which I have to speak about. So my opponent has a tech on the board that I couldn't remove. We start the turn. I have six resources. He has five. I ramped. And he's able to play a DJ from resources. And I know it's going to happen because it, he set it up. So I'm ready for it bec because there's nothing else I can do. I had to just play knowing it's going to happen. But the problem was, even though I had five cards in hand, not a single one of those cards was actually able to kill a DJ after it's being played. I didn't have a Zuckus, I didn't have a Stethos Battalion, I didn't have an overwhelming barrage. So I was, oh, and I didn't even have a McClunky. So it's like, it was like nothing. So he played the DJ and he takes one of my resources. But I know that it's one of my resources. I have the answer that I need because I had my Boba Leader on the, on, on the, on the arena. And in one of those resources, I do have a... Um, I do have a blaster. So I'm able to attack for six with the leader and kill the DJ to take my resource back. But he rolls a die and he gets my resource, right? I had six resources. I had one blaster in it. And he rolls the exact number that the blast was assigned to. So he takes my blaster. And I thought I'm, uh, I lost it on the spot right there. But somehow I was able to just still build the pressure and then just win the game somehow. I can't remember the details, to be honest, because it was a blur. But somehow I won against the hand yellow. So I was 4-0 at that point. The next turn was against Pulp Blue. The worst possible matchup for my deck. And I think I never played as well as I did against this Pulp Blue. In the first game, I played it perfectly. I played around removal, I dealt consistent damage, I was building enough board for him to have to remove, but like very awkward if he wanted to super laser blast, and I was able to play like a fire spray that he entrenched, then I en that entrenched fire spray was able to overwhelming barrage for 10 damage, and then I could do like a, the McClunky play that I explained before, I was playing it really, really well. And I thought, from my perspective, that my opponent should have conceded game one to preserve time. But he didn't. He was playing it all the time. He had to play his Palpatine without taking a unit because of how well I was managing the board. He had to do it just to get a 410 unit on the board with no effect. At that point, I knew the game is won. So, but it still went on and on. And I killed him after like 35 minutes. We had 20 minutes to finish two games. Second game, 
I had a terrible start. I was trying to like figure out what to do, how to game plan the game, but I couldn't do it. And after I think 16 minutes of game two, I lost. We had three minutes left to finish game three. Obviously, it was not, not fast enough to, uh, it was not um, enough to finish game three, so we got a double loss. But I do think that my opponent didn't recognize that game one was unwinnable for him and didn't concede the game one to preserve time, which I do think is a mistake if you play a deck like Pipe Blue. You need to understand when the game is lost. Like, otherwise, you're going to end up in double losses like this a lot of time. Uh, then after that, I so I was 5-1, sorry, 4-1, and I played against Hantu ECL, which I think is a very favorable matchup for me. And my opponent wasn't also that experienced, I think, um, against uh, not only like Boba ECL version. Maybe he was, I don't know. But um, he definitely didn't have a good matchup. And it felt like a walk in the park because of that. Um, yeah, it's just, just a good matchup for me. And then in last turn, I was uh, in last round, in round seven, I was playing against that Ray Tark in town uh, by one of the KTOD members, Dippy. And I'll be honest with you, I think I played well, but I also had disgusting draws. So that did help. Um, I think uh, the deck sometimes is just obscene. And I had two games in this tournament when I just slammed a Boba armor on a leader and ran away with it. One of that was Pulp Green, when I just Boba leader, armor, armor on the Boba leader, sla slam face. And against Ray Tarkitown, uh was very similar. Uh, and I just was able to like chain moles, deal the damage on the on on the small underworld unit, and just consistently pressure his face. In game two, like game one was like like I don't think he could have done much, but in game two, he had been like controlling the game pretty well. He had multiple space units that were uh, like one was one upgraded and with restore, and I couldn't really do much about them until I get to a point where I can just overwhelming barrage. And that's where... <laughs> so I accidentally made a genius play that... Uh, and I have to say, Dippy was a very fair player because he mentioned... Sorry, not mentioned. He corrected the game state that was unfavorable to him. So let me explain. I played a mole, turn before, killed a unit, and didn't get a damage on it because I tanked it on a small unit. So it was a 7-6 mall in play he had initiative um and maybe it was that no he had initiative and then i attacked uh, he attacked with a with a space unit i blasted my mole into his base for nine was it that way god damn it well, definitely was the mole with a blaster that was attacking for 9 damage to the base. But something before that had to die because he was able to play a Luke Skywalker from hand to kill my mole, but he didn't do it. And I just played Overwhelming Barrage on mole to like deal massive damage to his space units and clear... Oh, I know what happened. I think he attacked with a with his ray. God damn it, I can't remember the details. Anyway, the point was, I accidentally made a genius play because I played Overwhelming Barrage on my mole with a blaster to deal 11 damage, which was nice. That was, that was the, like, I just saw that and I was like, yeah, 11 damage, man. And after he dealt damage to the base, like, that's pretty good, good deal. So I'm just gonna deal, deal that 11 damage to kill the units and hope what's, and hope he doesn't have a look. He had a look. So he placed the look, and I just take the mole and put it into the discard because, like, yeah, uh, minus six, minus six, well, shit happens. But then he goes, no, 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 he stays on the board because of the buff. And I was like, I'm a genius. Obviously, I planned this. So he corrects me to put the mole into the board, and that's fair play. He didn't have to do it. He could have abused my mistake. He didn't chose to do this. Lost the game because of that. But at the same time, you know, I I I do same stuff like that as well. I don't like if I like it, it's it's uh, commendable, I will remember his name, and I hope people that play against me that 
I also try to like keep the go board state clean and play clean will remember me as well uh, as well this way. So hats off Dippy was a good game. Uh, and that was the seven round. And after that, I was incredibly happy that I made the top eight. And if you know, if you want to know the rest of the story, then watch the previous movie that I, uh, previous video, movie, previous video that I released on this channel about the entire drama of Planetary Qualifier and how I was disqualified after being 6-1 and wanting to play in the top eight. Thank you. Bye-bye.